YouTubers and welcome back to the Holtz Mitchell channel and another episode of Random Links. Yeah, these are getting, starting to stack up, aren't they? Well, today's a different subject. Um, a lot of you probably wonder um, how a saw can run true, such as surface saw blade, for example. Um, we're going to take a, a little bit closer look at one of these and how they're put together. Um, I'll bring you in a little closer, but if you've ever noticed that uh, some saws run nice and straight when you look down the, you know, down the teeth and they're running nice and true when you turn them on, and then others have a tendency to kind of to wave um, as you're looking at them. Now the process that uh, makes the saw, that takes that wave out of a saw, if you were to take, <clears throat> take just any old piece of sheet metal, because essentially that's all a saw is, is a piece of sheet metal, and spin it real fast, it's going to wave, you know, at least a thin piece. Now the thicker, of course, you go, um, the more stable it's going to be, but, uh, you know, in recent times, you know, within the last 50 years or so, um, we've gotten away from the thick saw blades, you know, um, in old sawmills, for example, the big the big saw blades, they'll have like a 3 8 kerf, that's 10 millimeters for you metric folks out there. And so the Scribner C scale was, or Scribner scale, for example, was based on um, that big kerf um, for scaling a log to see what kind of volume's in it. And um, so we've gotten away from that, and then, you know, there's still sawmills out there that got those big blades, but most of them have gone to these, these thin kind of blades. And this one here is just three millimeters thick, or even if that, I, yeah, it could be three, it might be two and a half, but um, the tendency is to go narrower, and for a multitude of reasons. One is saving material, of course, on the blade. Two is saving uh, material in the in the um, you know in the wood you know um, make it a narrow curve so you're losing less to waste than you are with a wider one so anyway let me bring you around here and show you the process that it took to uh, it's called benching by the way and you can see some of the traces of that process on the face of this blade right here and then also um, I took a uh, an old saw blade and cut it up to use the uh, use parts of it for um, a parting tool for the lathe, um, and I'll show you that up close here uh, as well. But the the main focus here is is the process that uh, makes a saw blade run nice and straight. So let me bring you around here. Okay, so as I mentioned before, there's a process called benching. Um, that makes the blade uh, run true. And when you look at the cross section of a blade, uh, like right here, you'll notice you know you've got the corpus, the body itself. Uh, some are equipped with uh, slots. These are expansion slots, by the way, that allow the blade to, to or prevent the blade from starting to flutter as they get warm. Now, if you look closely here, you can see right around here on this perimeter, there's a detent, and there was pressure applied through either a, you know a roller or some uh, pressure device, you know where it was like a kind of like an English wheel um, that stretches this part of the saw blade, expands it outward and then also in the, in, the, in the tangent. And so that way it stabilizes the blade, it gives it some inertia, it, 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 internal uh, tension and um, keeps the saw line, the tooth line, nice and straight. Now this blade, of course, you can see it's been burnt. It uh, has some nice uh, blue spots on it here. Let's see if we can get that in there. Yeah, here we go. You can see the the bluing here in the chrome. Now this blade is, has been heated up and uh, it's ruined, so it's going to get cut up for parting tools and that sort of thing. 
Now, on this parting tool, you can see the, the benchmarks too. Um, notice the word benchmarks, okay? That, uh, that is visible right here. And again, it's about one third in of the width of the saw. So when you look at this, um, we've got about 100 millimeters uh, from the gullet of the tooth to the outside of the hub, and we have about 35 millimeters to the benchmark. So that's roughly about a third, because a third would be 33 millimeters, 35 you know, you're in the ballpark. And so the same thing on band saws and uh, other gang saws, for example, which is just a, you know, a long saw. You have this in your hand saws. Um, you know, you're um, like this. Hang on, let me grab one. In one of these, for example, um, you'd have a benchmark, you can't see it on this one, this is pretty old and rusty and it's got hardened teeth, but the benchmark would be running somewhere parallel to here uh, in order to keep the tooth line nice and straight as you're looking down it. So, and this one here has two benchmarks. <coughs> It just depends on the type of saw blade. The, the more material you have without these cutouts, um, the more important that benching the saw becomes. <clears throat> now, if you've ever looked at, uh, you know, if you look at this on, with the surface, uh, with, the, with one of these uh, hairline rulers, this is a hairline square, I'd show it to you, but it's hard to see this, but you can see when you hold this up to the light, um, there's, you know, a detent here. Let me see if we can't uh, get this going here and, and uh, demonstrate that. So there you can see, I'll put an arrow there to point it out. It's real visible right there. Oh boy. Well, YouTubers, I, uh, I realize that today's random lengths, you know, isn't really all the, you know, the greatest show to, you know, to showcase the, the uh, process of benching. Like I said, the machine itself that benches a saw, it resembles closely a, a, an English wheel. And uh, you could even do, uh, do that on, a, on an English wheel. The only thing you'd have to have is one of those cone-shaped... Uh, doohickeys that you can put a nut down onto to you know center the blade and then uh, stick it on a on a uh, on a mandrel and then uh, rotate the blade in between the in between the wheels you know like yay um, for long band saws of course it pretty much is an English wheel um, there are different machines out there on the market um, I don't know if I'll be able to, to find one on the internet, uh, a picture of one, but in case I don't, you know, just uh, I might just include a link if I do find one, or I'll, I'll look anyway and, and, and try and find one, but um, uh, don't hold your breath on it. Um, <clears throat> so again, benchmark, you know, that's the, you know, that's a kind of a, a term we've all heard at one point or another, but that's where that term, you know, that's this, this is where the term derives from, is the mark on the saw from benching it to give it some internal stability. Now, on older saws, for example, like uh, if you go into, uh, say, an old sawmill that has one of the big, humongous uh, um, circular saws, sometimes you'll see little dimples and you, you might not see them in one place, they'll be all over the place, you know, it just depends on um, where the blade was, uh, or, or who did the uh, benching on it. Um, I knew an old timer up in Red River, Idaho, um, that uh, he could, you know, he could do his own saws. He used to have a sawmill, and uh, he'd take a ball peen hammer and another hammer, and just lay it on the anvil and smack it, and that thing run pretty true, and that's, and that Given that tension, you know, you're, you're tensioning, it's self-tension is what this, 
what the what the term actually um, would be correctly called. Um, by self tensioning the blade, you know it it uh, it will run true. Now you'll look on say um, ductwork, you'll see the crisscross in the in the panels, and that keeps the panel from starting to vibrate. Um, again, that's stretching that metal just ever so slightly to give it some internal strength to where it doesn't uh, start to you know f f you know flutter. And, and wobble. And same thing on a car. Um, when you look at the fenders, those, those creases in the fenders and so forth, those are there for a reason. And it's not just to look good, but it's also to give that weak, otherwise weak metal uh, um, uh, an internal strength that it otherwise wouldn't have. And so that's the principle behind benching your saws. And that's also why your saws will run true. So if you have an old saw that you, you know, that's already hoopa juped you might as well just go ahead and you know play around with it and uh, give her a smack or two and see if you can't straighten her out you know um, these saws with the with cutouts in them like this one well let me bring this in close here so you can see um, you, there's all kinds of cutouts now the cutouts serve several functions uh, I might mention this before. One is thermal expansion, and then two is chip clearance. It actually helps evacuate the chips from the cut, and then also the third is cooling, uh, that it will actually draw air in as the the saw leaves the cut and uh, creates a turbulence around the blade and helps cool the blade a little bit. So those are the three functions of the cutouts on a saw blade. Now, on for say example on um, sash gang saws. Um, the mill I apprenticed in we had a sash gang saw and our blades had, I'll, I'll show you a picture of one of those, um, but this is without the holes. Our, our blades had a set of T-holes and those T-holes were in there to eliminate having to bench the saws um, because there was um, enough material in the front and in the back of the, of the saw that was being stretched and so the evacuation of the material in the middle by the T-slots um, helped give the saw some internal tension to where it didn't have to be benched anymore. Um, and, you know, just kind of as a side note. You don't see those kind of saws. I mean, this is kind of what this goes to, but it's not the same thing. So anyway, hope that uh, clarifies a few little mysteries about saws. For you guys out there that and gals that uh, work with wood, um, if there's any co thoughts, comments, critiques, suggestions, or just wanting to say hi, just put it down in the comment section below. Uh, you know, as as you see with most of the comments in, in my videos, I do make an effort to to answer those. Uh, the ones I don't answer aren't necessarily, um, you know, I'll give it a thumbs up to to where you know I've read it. Um, because some, you know, some comments just don't really require an, an answer as such, you know. There's been some folks out there that have made some excellent comments that are spot on and just don't need answering from me, you know, to give my two cents worth. So I just give it a thumbs up and uh, let it stand as it is. So, but I'm always open for dialogue and if there's any questions, by all means, throw it in the comment section below and we'll get to you guys as soon as we can. So with that, thank you for stopping by and we'll see you again soon. Thank you.